Today I want to talk to you about the master-slave relationship that exists in Hollywood. Uh, a perfect example of this is the High Harvey Weinstein disaster. Okay, we all know about Harvey Weinstein, how for at least 25 years he was raping women violently, and, and some not so violently, but I mean it was all by force. He was raping women for 25 years using his position to have sex with every beautiful starlet he could get his greedy hands on. Well, what's going on there? That's the master-slave relationship. Uh, he's a very powerful man, and he could make you or break you or ruin you or kill you for all effective purposes. He could do worse than kill you. He could make it so you never work again in Hollywood, and he could completely take away your dreams. Okay, that's the master-slave relationship in Hollywood. I have very direct experience with this master-slave relationship. I was as the slave, of course. In 1987, I made a movie uh, with public access television. Now, movie cameras and all that stuff and you know the ability to edit things, none of that was available in 1987. So me and my best friend, the guy I call Abdul in my book, that's not his real name, we made a movie together. And so first we did a play, and it was a huge hit, uh, and we just did it at the local college. And then we, it was his idea, he's the big idea guy, and he was my best friend, and we always hung out. He's like, we need to make a movie, and he found out all about this public access stuff, and so we went to the public access in Prince George's County, Maryland, and we made a movie, and, in, and it took a whole year to make this movie. We worked really hard on it. I did all the directing, the producing. I cast the actors. I did the cinematography. I did the lighting. I did the sound, and he was my star actor. That was a huge mistake. I needed to be the star actor, and I'm actually a better actor than him, but I was camera shy, and I didn't want to be in front of the camera. That's a huge mistake. But anyway, so in 1988, I won, I, I swept all their awards. I won all their awards, uh, me and my buddy Abdul. Abdul went on, he went to California, he pretended to be me, he took credit for everything that I did. He ended up winning a Grammy in the New Age category for music. So he did okay, okay? He did find some success in Hollywood. He's not there on the bro Boulevard of Broken Dreams, but he's never made more than like five cents in his whole life, which is odd. But anyway, uh, so this is that story. So I made that, I won those awards in 1987, and through my church, uh, through the pastor of my church, I was belonged to a mega church, I ended up leading, you know, becoming a, a big leader in that church, and that's some of the best years of my life. Uh, I ended up feeding the homeless. But anyway, this is before that. So through the pastor, I, he connected me to a Hollywood writer. And this guy was a working writer in Hollywood. He wrote for Coach. Remember Coach? He wrote for the Wonder, Wonder Years. Remember Winnie? I love Winnie. Man, she's so cute. Uh, that, those were great shows. So this guy, uh, and I can't tell you his name, he hooked me up and... He helped me out, and eventually uh, I came to the attention of the most famous director in Hollywood, Shem Steinberg. And this is my personal experience with Shem Steinberg. So when I talk about Hollywood and the evils of Hollywood, I actually know. I've had a lifelong, very malignant relationship with this man, Shem Steinberg. Uh, and it's really odd that it's so malignant. Um, and it's so violent and so malignant. He wants to hurt me so bad. Uh, and he's tried to hurt me so many. He's literally tried to have people kill me several times, which sounds really weird, but it's true. Uh, and he's so nasty to me that, when was it? I graduated college in 1993. And so I, I graduated with almost straight A's. So the last couple of years of schooling, I got literally straight A's. I went from, you know, B's and C's to straight A's. So I had just graduated, I had interviewed, and I was about to get my first job right out of school. And Shem Steinberg, I call him Shem Statenberg, he was watching me the whole time, 
from California, you know, twisting his mustache, molesting children, you know, laughing maniacally. And so he knew that I was getting my first job. It was a great job. It was right there on Pennsylvania Avenue. You look to the right, there's the White House. You look to the left, there's the Capitol. And the dude who was giving me this job, great job. It was, it was a ladder straight up to a GS-13, right up into the 100Ks. Okay, in, in a couple of years, I'm gonna be making over six figures. It's an easy government job. And the dude I was gonna work for, he was like a really chill guy. You know, I really like this guy. So I'm talking to this guy, I'm about to sign the papers for the job, because of course I'm gonna take this job, just got out of college. Shem Steinberg, Shem Satanberg calls up this guy and he's got Grossman on the line. Steinberg tells this guy that there's a warrant for my arrest in California. Shem Satanberg, the, the most famous director in Hollywood, he's a billionaire. I guarantee you've seen his movies. Okay, uh, his, his, he has an adopted black daughter who just announced that she is gonna do porn now. Okay, and I need to look up that porn video. But I know her personally. She's actually tried to shoot me with a gun in both Maryland and in uh, California, and this is in my book. And several times she's tried to murder me with this gun. And she's, man, she's a nutcase. She's a fruit loop. I'm reading from chapter 63 of my book, uh, Son of a Serial Killer, and it's entitled Curse of the Steinbergs. Congratulations. It's my pleasure to offer you the job. You'll work directly for me. We're a cabinet level agency, non appropriation funded. He smiled and we shook hands. He was a few years older than me, very smart, very cool, and seemed like a genuine nice guy. Great. I must have looked slightly confused. We are non-appropriation funded because it's not necessary for the Congress to approve a budget for us. We fund all our operations through service fees and we collect substantially greater fees than our budget every year. Can't touch this. He twisted his body like MC Hammer before resuming his professional demeanor. That's even better, I said. Indeed. I'm going to run your information through our vetting process and we'll bring you on board next Monday. Monday is excellent. I was almost completely broke after taking off for a year and paying for school. My new office was on Pennsylvania Avenue, directly in front of the Capitol building, and three blocks from the White House on the other side. The job paid well, and it was a ladder, meaning that in four years, my salary would triple. Things were looking up. There's a problem. It was two hours later, and I recognized the voice on the line as my new supervisor, who just offered me the job. What kind of problem? I was at home relaxing after the stress of the interview, the long trip downtown, and back out of the city. How soon can you get here? You want me to come back into the city? I need you to come in immediately. Why don't I come tomorrow morning? I said, dreading the long trip back into the city. There won't be a job here for you tomorrow morning. I need you to come in today. Okay, how quickly can you get here? If I leave now, I'll be there in about an hour. Are we going upstairs? I waved hello as he poked his head through the locked glass door of the office building. An armed security officer glared at me, touched his gun, and stepped from behind his standing desk. No. He pulled me away from the doors and grabbed me by both shoulders to stand square to me. A nationwide record search revealed a warrant for your arrest in California. I've never been to California. My mind was blank. I made some calls and I've been informed by reliable sources that you threatened the famous movie producer Shep, Shep Steinberg and made racist remarks to his daughter. He watched for my reaction as he delivered the news. How do you know it's me? Probably it's someone with the same name, I said. I wanted to get your side of the story before I called them back. He led me to a tiny outside seating area, away from the busy avenue with a circular concrete bench surrounded by flowers and shrubs. Who are you calling, I asked. Hello? Yes, he's here. Who is this? I recognized the overly aggressive screaming voice on the line immediately. I said nothing. This was a professional call and I planned above all to keep my composure. If I blew it, I lost this job and perhaps worse. Well, is her there or not? Yes, he's here. Speak up, you little pissant. Cat got your tongue, mother Grossman said. Hello, Mr. Grossman. How can I help you, I said. That's him. I heard Steinberg's voice in the background. Did you start without me? I got here as quick as I could. I heard Abdul's voice. He was mean to me, Daddy. I want you to put him in jail. I heard the voice of Steinberg's daughter, red hair and freckles. We'll do better than that, honey. Just watch, Steinberg said. I told you I would ruin your life. I'm going to destroy you. you Are you recording this? You better not be recording this. I'll have you arrested. 
You are not per permitted to record this call. It was the lawyer's voice. The memories returned in a flood. Are you recording, I said? Of course we're recording. They laughed. We are not recording. My future supervisor spoke quietly into the phone. He extracted a recorder from his pocket, set his phone to speaker, and pressed record. He looked at me and pressed his fingers to his lips. You're dead. Your life is over. I told you not to f me. Grossman was a raging bull. You'll never work in this town, Steinberg said. Why? I said. Because you threatened Mr. Steinberg and insulted his daughter, Grossman said. You were mean to me, Red Hair and Freckles said. You stole my movie, Abdul said. I didn't insult his daughter, and why would I threaten any of you, I said. F I'm going to destroy you, Grossman said. Hold on a second. What are you saying? Steinberg was quieter and more reserved. That was a job interview. I accepted the job, and everything went crazy, I said. You didn't accept the job. You hung up on us and made racist remarks to Mr. Steinberg's daughter. You're a racist, Red Hair and Freckles said. I'm not a racist. If there are racist people on this conversation, I am not among them, I said. That's enough, Steinberg said. Listen to the tape. Five people came into the room and attacked me with guns. You can hear me screaming. I even screamed their names before they hung up the phone. I said, did you call the police? Of course I called the police. What happened? Nothing happened. They threatened me. I said, I quit that job a dozen times, but they kidnapped me and took me to work every day. I wasn't paid for two weeks, but they kidnapped me at gunpoint every day and took me to work. So you tried to come here? Steinberg sounded sympathetic. I couldn't get away from them. Every time I tried to leave, they just kidnapped me at gunpoint. He's lying, Abdul said. That's quite a story, Grossman laughed. What are you saying? That you still want to work for me, Steinberg said? Of course. That was my big break, I said. Well, you know, the job we offered is long gone. We might be able to find a low-level job for you somewhere. I'm sure the jobs you have there are better, Steinberg pretended to reason. I love it here. It's like living a dream, Abdul said. I don't want him here, Daddy. I like Abdul. I'm not so sure. You seem to work exceptionally hard at ruining my life. I just got hired for this job, and you put out a fake warrant for my arrest in California. You threatened Mr. Steinberg, Grossman said. We'll send you a ticket to come out, but it won't be first class, and you'll have to get on the plane immediately. No excuses this time. I'll do what I have to to get away, I said. I still want him arrested, Grossman said. I want him arrested too, Red Hair and Freckles said. He stole my movie and he threatened me, Abdul said. We'll have him picked up on the warrants at the airport, the lawyer said. If I work for you, there are no warrants and you won't falsely arrest me for anything, I said. You threatened Mr. Steinberg, Grossman insisted. You called everyone I know, including my mother, my sister, my father, all my co-workers, and even the head of the agency telling them you were going to kill me. You threatened me, I said. You can't prove anything, Grossman laughed. This is gold. He's threatening you, my supervisor whispered. No warrants, no arrest, I said. We'll decide when you get here, Steinberg said. No warrants, no arrest. You've got nothing to bargain with, Grossman said. You'll come here or we'll destroy you. It's a done deal, the lawyer said. I just graduated with honors in accounting. I couldn't watch a movie for 10 years, and I forgot that you existed. It was like a bad dream. Now I find out you've been plotting against me all these years? Get over it and forget about me. I'll live my life and you live yours, I said. Let's make him a grip, Steinberg said. He can make my coffee, Grossman said. He'll probably poison it. You don't have a choice. Be on that plane tonight. We'll decide what to do with you when you get here, Grossman said. I'll pass. Forget about me. I couldn't even remember any of this until you popped up again, I said. You're getting on that plane tonight or I'm going to make it my job to destroy your life, Grossman said. So I come and have a fair shot. No warrants and no arrest, I said. Well, we can have you arrested at any time, Grossman said. Keep him on a short lease. Leash, Steinberg said. I think we should have him arrested as a prophylactic, his lawyer said. I agree. We're definitely going to have you arrested, Grossman giggled. I'm not coming. You don't have a choice. Be on that plane tonight. I'm not coming there to get arrested, I said. Yes, you are, Grossman growled. I didn't do anything, I said. Can we have him arrested there, Steinberg said. Let's just be done with this thing, the lawyer said. <laughs> Grossman said. You can't have me arrested for nothing. I've never even met you, I said. Yes, we can, the lawyer said. I told you I would ruin your life, Grossman said. Okay, I'll come. But only if you don't arrest me and there are no warrants, I said. It's too late now. <laughs> Grossman was like a wolf. I'll call the police now and execute the warrants. Where are you? The lawyer asked. Grossman laughed and red hair and freckles giggled. I'm right here. Where are you? I said. What is the address of your current location? I'm sending an officer to, your, to arrest you now, the lawyer said. Tell us where you are, you little... <laughs> 
This is awesome, Abdul said. Can we have him arrested for stealing my movie? You'll have to file a civil lawsuit for that. I love you, Daddy, red-haired freckles gushed. We're at the Benson Building on Pennsylvania Avenue. The address here is, and he gave the address. We're in the garden in the back. My future, not my supervisor, read out our exact location, glancing up nervously at me as he did. What the I said, and my supervisor jumped. I told you not to I chuckled. I lost my cool. Whoa, there he is. I told you he was a drug addict, Abdul said. Any last words before you spend the rest of your life in a revolving door of prison? Grossman asked. Yeah. I'll be at home sitting on the couch. I won't resist any efforts to falsely arrest me. There is no point, I said. What's the address? It's the address listed on my resume in your hand, I said. I don't have the resume in front of me. I heard the lawyer flip through some papers. I know his address, Abdul said. I have it too. It's on my application. It's on his application, not my supervisor said. You're going to jail tonight, boy. How do you like me now? Grossman gloated. Okay, so I'm going into jail tonight. You can tell them to pick me up at home. I'll grab some food, have a shower, and change into some clean clothes. No telling when my next meal will be, I said. I love you, Daddy. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. You're welcome. This is what happens to my enemies, Grossman said. And this is what happens to my enemies who steal my movie, who threaten me and tell countless lies about me and then rejoice in their own cruelty, I said. What? Remember who you're talking to, young man, Steinberg admonished. State your name, I said. Les Grossman, I felt Grossman smile. Admit that you serve Satan. I love Satan. Satan is my I'll play. I serve Satan too, the lawyer laughed. It shall be for you as you say, Mr. Steinberg. State your name, I commanded. Steinberg was silent. I heard him whisper to someone in the background. Hear the word of the Lord. There is something in your neck now. No, it's in your head and it's growing. I feel it on the right side. Unless you repent of your wickedness, you will die and soon be forgotten. It will be as if you never existed. I could seal it. I could see it and feel it. Who are you talking to? Grossman demanded. He's crazy, Steinberg said. I don't like him, Red Hair and Freckles said. He's threatening us, the lawyer said. He's on drugs, Abdul said. As I bind on the earth, so it is bound in heaven. As I loose on the earth, so shall it be loosed in heaven. It is done. Are you done, Fruit Loop? Grossman mocked. If you arrest me, this is not the end, but a beginning. I have no choice but to deal with these vicious animals obsessing over me and attacking me ten years after I had a single conversation with them. If you choose not to hire me, then so be it. But filing false charges and making it impossible for me to work anywhere, even after I, after I graduated with honors in a completely different field, this is a problem that demands a solution, I said. What are you going to do? There's nothing you can do, Grossman said. My words are true. It shall be as I say. Beyond that, if I cannot work in the legitimate world, I would note that the illegitimate economy is at least as large and perhaps larger than the legitimate economy. Business is business and my skills and abilities will be greatly valued there as well, I said. He's threatening us. You heard it, the lawyer said. You will die, sir. The Lord has spoken, I said. Let's have him arrested and be done with it. Steinberg sweated. If you have me arrested, nothing is done. It is just the beginning. As sure as the sun rises, you will see my face. I give you my word, I said. Do you know who you're talking to? Grossman demanded. I'm talking to a dead man. You have one hour to remove these fake warrants from my arrest. And if you ever bother me again, it shall be as I said. <laughs> Grossman screamed. Are you threatening me? Steinberg demand, demanded. I have done nothing to you. We have never met. You have one hour. If I do not hear from you, then I know that the police are coming and it begins. Otherwise, you call me and tell me, I said. I picked up my favorite fast food on the way home. I took a shower, changed my clothes, and sat down on the couch. Fifteen minutes later, I received a phone call. Joseph Magellan? Yes. The warrants are quashed. What actually happened as a result of that curse is Grossman and the writer died of brain cancer. I saw and felt something in their neck, and it grew, and it slowly killed them very, very painfully. Steinberg himself, the great and famous director, got cancer. The next time Steinberg called me, it was a five and a half hour conversation. And wow, what a cluster. Anyway, I cursed him again in 2010 on when I was retiring because this man will not leave me alone. He again 
had a recurrence of cancer. And his daughter, I, his daughter went just completely nuts. She's actually demon-possessed, red hair and freckles. Two people died. I don't know about the lawyer. I do believe I cursed the lawyer as well, and the lawyer played along. I'm not sure, but definitely Grossman. Grossman was very, very famous. He was, he was the most famous, most powerful producer in Hollywood. I actually believe that Harvey Weinstein took his place after his death, but his, all of his wealth was wiped out. He died very painfully and very slowly as a result of that curse. And that is part of my relationship with Shem Steinberg, a very, very negative, very malignant, very violent relationship, a master-slave relationship. And I'm the slave, and Steinberg thinks that he's the master.